Welcome back to the uh, Breakfast Central. Now we're going to be reviewing the papers and just to mention that the way we usually do it here, of course, is to open the phone lines and afford you the opportunity to be a part of the conversation. And then we share, you know, we would just like to also ask that before you call in, you turn down the volume of your TV screen. So we're going to go through the papers and then we'll share with you who our analyst is. But this morning we're looking at the front page of the Vanguard newspaper. On the front page of the Vanguard newspaper, why grains importation won't happen soon by stakeholders? One month gone already as federal government fine-tunes policy. Customs awaits list of importers. Stakeholders divided on policy. 100 tons capacity excludes our member, says Rimford. Medical students abduction, Governor Ilya, NMA, Health Ministry Task, Security Agents on Rescue. Minimum wage, we won't accept unauthorized recruitment into agencies, according to federal government. Azinge emerges 14th Asaba of Asaba designate. Oh. Bad economy, drop in passenger traffic on settles domestic uh, airlines, a drop in passenger traffic. And then we also have at the top of the paper, Serap to Akwabi and Abbas, disclose monthly running cost of National Assembly. Scarcity, NNPC blames distribution challenges. Independent marketers sell at 950 per litre. OPIC lease, Amosun Utomi Bika over contract violation. That's a big story. But uh, that's all on the Vanguard. Let's head to the next paper. The Daily Independence got these headlines first uh, front and center. Low purchasing power locks out retail investors from rice issue. And I'm not eyeing Tinubu's job, says Ganduje. Reps ask mm -hmm. Amcon to go after debtors irrespective of social status. And I suffer the same fate as the Chinese firm under Amosun, says Pat Utomi. Um, on page six here, Benway tops child trafficking list in Nigeria for three consecutive years. And Tinubu travels to France today. At the very top for the Daily Independence, Edo gubernatorial polls, PDP raises the alarm over arrest of party chieftains by police and rivers crisis. Once again in the news, police unveil prime suspect in hotel attack, trail APP secretary at arsonist. And at the very bottom, alleged 21 million naira jumbo pay account for running costs strapped hell's Nas uh, National Assembly. And at the very bottom, NNPCL denies owing international all traders $6.8 billion. That on page six. That's it for the Daily Independence. All right, the Punch newspaper says... Food crisis may worsen as flood hits 10 states. Farmers groan as floods ravage farmlands in Sokoto, Kano, KB, seven others. SEMA 6 government help as droughts dry up crops in four states. 31 states risk flooding. Police detect hunt 20 varsity students abductors. Vietnam-bound businessman excretes 88, 88 cocaine wraps. Wow. Civil servant screening on IPPIS portal ends on Friday, according to the federal government. NMPC battles deepening fuel scarcity, black market booms. Presidential jets, Abiodun consults federal government as Utomi tackles Amosum. Federal government eyes $2 billion from local dollar bond sale. And final story here, fake degrees. Federal government orders varsities to submit matriculation lists. That's all on the punch. Let's now head to the Daily Times. Daily Times this morning for a Monday, Utomi Amosu trade tackles over contract violation. I was a victim of Amosu's violation of contract terms, says Utomi. Utomi suffering from an entitlement mentality, says Amosu. Interesting. Serap to Akwabi Abbas, disclosed National Assembly running costs or face legal action. And under that, Tinubu departs uh, Abuja for France today. Another iteration on this paper. At the very top for the Daily Times. Fuel queues resurface in Lagos amid sto uh, uh, stock shortage. Well, really, is it shortage or just being hoarded? We'll find out. And FIRS targets 19.4 trillion naira seeks legal framework for cryptocurrency taxation, drought, Kogi government, Afan seek divine intervention. And that's it for the Daily Times for a Monday. And I think that's all the papers we'll be talking are from this morning. All right, let's begin with the Vanguard newspaper. On the front page of the Vanguard newspaper, uh, the big story there is why grains importation won't happen soon by stakeholders. Uh, we'll come back to talk about this, but we're joined by public affairs analyst G. D. Johnson. Good morning. Thank you for joining it's us. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. And good morning. To good morning. Our about and even as we discuss the story, just to mention once again to our viewers that you can call in. The numbers to call will be on your TV screen. But please remember to turn down the volume of your TV set or whatever device you're watching us from before calling in. Let's get into the conversation this morning about um, grains and importation not happening soon by stakeholders. They are awaiting the list of uh, importers. Recently, we talked about the import waiver that was going to happen, and there were a list of products in that category. We have a list of food items covered by the executive order. 
husks, brown rice, beans, millet, grain, sorghum, maize, and wheat. And uh, a few minutes ago, we had the president of the Premium Bakers Association of Nigeria talking about how he thinks that that waiver should be extended from 150 days to two to three years. President of the Africa Development Bank is against it. He says that he's not going to encourage local production because if we're looking at import and we're just focusing on import, what about the local farmers? And even we had a farmer join us last week to talk about him having gotten a loan to do local production and now we're not, they're not quite sure what will be their future. So what, what do you make of all of yeah, this? I think there should be a short-term approach to it, a short-term approach with a long-term plan in view. Presently, Nigerians are hungry. There's no doubt about that, and you can't get farm produce in, in one month, in two months, in three months. It's whatever you have planted. In one of the stories we had, about 10 states in the north already been flooded. That's mm -hmm. an indication that there will be shortage of food supply next year because already what they've planted has already been washed away by. But I think uh, what is required is for us to have a comprehensive plan. Okay, for the next three years, we are going to do this, but after that three years, in four years' time, we are going to have this by investing in agriculture, comprehensive investment in agriculture, giving farmers money, giving them loans so that they can start, and in four years' time, they begin to produce and begin to provide that yield. The first major global food crisis we have, first one documented, was the one that happened when um, Joseph was made the prime minister in Egypt, according mm -hmm. to documented evidence. And then it was a seven years comprehensive plan. Mm. It was a seven years comprehensive plan. So for food security, we can't adopt a knee jack approach. Even with the executive order, for one month, we are still belaboring the issue. The, they are still waiting for the list. The list has not already been uh, supplied. If it's oil prices right. that was removed, I, I'm telling you, within the twinkle of an eye, you see the effect. But when it comes to something that affects the mass, you see that it, it takes a lot of food dragging, red tapism, a lot of bureaucracy comes into it. And as a result of that, you don't tend to enjoy the full benefit of that policy intervention, All which right. is meant to solve an immediate problem. We have Benjamin calling from Ghana. Good morning, Benjamin. Thanks morning. for calling. Please go ahead with your comment. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm calling on the situation of Nigeria now. And when I was listening to your first guest, the, the bread man, you know, it's so appalling the situation of Nigeria now. And from the look of things, Nigeria is heading, you know, it's like a plane, you know, on a nose dive. We can't even produce what we eat. And the government is gradually introducing GMO to us, telling us we can eat and die. You know, Nigeria has the potential to be one of the greatest nations on the surface of the earth. But we are begging. Nigeria is the only country on the surface of the earth that God has blessed with natural resources, but we can't produce anything. We rather import many things of the things we eat. Nigeria is the oil company, oil, uh, it's a country that has oil, but we don't have one refinery. And you think Nigeria will survive? My brother, Nigeria will survive. Look at doctors that are being kidnapped. Who is going? Who is who? Who, who is going to watch the watchman? Police can't investigate uh, uh, custom. Custom can't investigate police. Nobody can. Nobody is holding anybody accountable. And our president is traveling as if nothing is happening. There's something in Nigeria that says you, a man can't. You know, he can't. He can't be chasing a rat while your heart, uh, house is burning. Can you tell me what all this travel they are traveling? What is it? What is what is the benefit to Nigerians? Why can't they cut down all this traveling and face the real fact about Nigeria and get food, common food to make Nigerians survive? And they are getting, you know, look at our budget, budget, salary everywhere. You know, Nigerians, it's time for Nigerians to make their budget in you know, by the phone. And the man can be right. from the leader. Benjamin, we have to go now. Thank you very much for Thank calling. You. And he, he's made very, very valid points, one of which is you know, cutting down the cost of governance in a sense. And I want to bring us back to the story of Serap to Akpabu and Abase saying, disclose monthly running cost of National Assembly. Why is it such a big deal well, that we can't focus, see exactly what's the... The focus is usually on National Assembly. If you look at that of the executive, it's mind-blowing. Security if, votes. If, if you look at that of NNPC, which is just an agency uh, under the, the presidency, which is part of the executive, it's mind-blowing. One of the things we have 
called for is complete transparency in the way government is being run. Not only in the National Assembly alone, but every agency, ministry, departments, and agencies of government. Nigeria needs to know what is being expended in terms of running, running, running costs. Like the one concerning travel, some people collect extra code. You remember last year when the president said, okay, I'm going to reduce the, the allowances of foreign travels by 50%. We are going to, uh, as that taken, as that taken is, in fact, the president was in Malabo last week. Um, is now in France. Uh, one of the basic principles of growth is that growth does not come from abroad. It comes from within. The first law of success is first within, then without. I think for us to grow, foreigners will not help us to grow this, this economy. We are the ones that will grow the economy ourselves. We are the ones that will grow this country. But when you have a situation where too much attention is paid to foreign travels, then you don't have time to pay attention to what is happening, what is happening at home. And then what is the cost implication of all of this travel? When we are being asked to manage our resources to live within our means because it's, it's an austere situation, whereas those that are in public offices are, 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 living, are living large. So it's, it's, it costs for much to be desired from those that are in public office. Now, I wanted to touch on something. Uh, there's a, there's a, spe a specific trend that seems to go through all of these stories. You're talking about travel now, domestic travel here in Nigeria is a problem. If people want to go through uh, using the uh, air route, but then again, they can't afford it. Right. Why are they trying air route? Because of the insecurity on the roads. We also talked about the uh, production of um, farm goods. Uh, Professor Zulum only just told that he's supporting farmers and talking to the Nigerian government to provide security for farmers. We've never had this in the past, where you have to have military guard farmers just so that they can make produce. But this is what we see. Now, it makes us ask the question regarding the security architecture in Nigeria, whether it absolutely needs to change. Is it just roadblocks that would, um, uh, 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 that would, it, tell that we have security in Nigeria, whether we put roadblocks here and there, or going into the communities to actually have a strong security architecture. What do we do regarding security? Also note that this is beginning to affect specific sectors like the health sector where we have people who have been kidnapped from the health sector. Like I said, they're being targeted. Students, 20 students going to Benway, a medical students, and then Professor, or uh, rather Dr. Ganiat from six months ago, if I'm not mistaken. What do we do regarding security since it seems to permeate every single thing, every single sector in Nigeria? Now, the issue of security is, is such an ironic um, situation for us in this country. One, the bulk of our vote goes to security vote, which invariably there's no transparency concerning that. When there is a threat of protest, you see the open display of security force. Uh, you see the way the security agencies were deployed during, quote unquote, the August uh, protest rally. And then you wonder if we have so much security, why can't it be deployed on a normal basis, on day to day basis, so that an average Nigerian is protected? The first basic responsibility of government is to protect the life and property of its citizen. Then, secondly, the territorial integrity of its country. Are we, are we doing that? Can we conveniently say that that is? And we have said it because we don't hold people in security agencies accountable. For example, there is an infraction in a local government. There is a DSS uh, head of that local government. There is a DP of that local government. There is the NCDC head of that local government. There is a police commissioner. There is a military formation. Do we hold them accountable? And you also put a question, what about the State Security Council? What their votes for it, how do they justify the votes they are spending on the State Security Council? How often do they convene such meeting? What are the deliberations that happen in, 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 in that meeting? It's like we are, we are on a free fall. Nobody seems to care about, about the security issue. Let me quickly conclude with this. We talk about food. Every time we talk about food, it's about food security. There's usually security that is attached with food security. Because if you can't feed your people, you expose your country to danger. Mm. I'm told that we have Ariel from Joss calling us in now. Ariel, good morning. Thank you for joining. Hello? Hello? I know we can hear you. Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, good morning, panel. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Go ahead. We can hear you. Yes. Um, you see, to be sincere, um, this country, we have a leader, but at the same time, we have a leader that has no direction to an extent. When you talk about this food crisis, it's partly caused by by man and partly caused by 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 natural disasters. When I talk about man, you see insecurity is one, and then the corruption 
that has eaten up the agri sector causes all this food shortage. How can you give a three months or four months plan for food to be imported into the country? How long does it take on a high sea for it to get here? And when do you adjust? When do people adjust to that? I think the government should be sincere. This thing has to stay a little bit longer. We need food for more than a year. The speaker, the panel you brought said uh, in the next, um, yes, the rain has destroyed most of the foods in the north. Where are we going to get food? You said by December, you gave uh, a deadline of December for food to be imported. For Christ's sake, how can food be able to stand us till December? This is a country that is large in population. It needs food. And what the country is producing for food cannot meet up the, cannot meet up the demand of the population. Secondly, uh, the National Assembly is not helping us. They are the worst set of um, uh, political, political staff that we have in the country. Something needs to be done about those people because they are taking what is not theirs. Taxpayers' money, you are taking 21 million naira every month. Where are you going with such money? You need to look at your, your people. You need to consider them. Please, this is my take. The government needs to sit up and people should. And we need to, to, to rise up to the truth in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank Ariel. Very much. He, he just mentioned something I was going to go on to now. The Daily Independence has this headline regarding the alleged 21 million naira jumbo pay. And that asking uh, account for running costs, Sarah tells National Assembly. Indeed, it does. But, uh, I mean, it's important. I mean, you have said that it's not just National Assembly, that mm. it should be executive and it's, all around. It's a comprehensive overhaul. Even yeah. though they will say maybe we should start from somewhere. But let's, let's quickly touch on um, the botched investment, the OPEC trade deal and the bickering between Patutomi and uh, the former governor of Ogun State. We're seeing here on the front page of the Daily Times newspaper, we had taken that earlier, Utomi Amosun trade tackles over contract violation. I uh, was a victim of Amosun's violation of contract terms, says Utomi. Utomi is suffering from a mentality, an entitlement mentality, says Senator uh, Amosun. And we see that all of this comes amidst the drama between the federal government, the Ogun state government, and the Chinese firm. Mm. So what are your thoughts on the drama going First and today? foremost, I thought the FCC should have invited all the actors and players in that um, botch contract because it was a disgrace to our nation that um, attempt to made to seize our presidential jet, which is the symbolism of our nationhood. Um, the negative effect is not just about now, it's forever. It's documented that the presidential have you ever heard of the presidential jet of any nation being seized because that's one who was the governor then we know the governor who was the uh, status of assembly speaker of the status of assembly who was the attorney general who was the accountant general who are those that were involved these are the set of people that should have been invited for questioning who are those that guarantee this loan at the federal government level you cannot be bringing the name of the nation into disrepute and you just think that you just grant a press conference and you gloss over it uh, by, by attacking another individual, saying that another individual is trying to. One of the things we have seen is that a lot of states, this is just the one we know. We don't know what other states have done in terms of contractual agreement that has not been fulfilled. Uh, one of the things we must put in place moving forward is for complete transparency when it comes to state government getting loan on behalf of their citizen um, before the federal government gives them uh, the, the guarantee that they can get that loan because state government cannot get any loan from from foreign from foreign investors except they are guaranteed by by, by the federal government so all those that were involved i thought the fcc should have invited them and they should have been questioned and then for them to explain their role in this um national international degrees it's, it's an international embarrassment and then for him to still even have the infantry of granting prayer and replying party to me we have seen over time that Government is not seen as a continuity in Nigeria. The moment a new government comes in, every other agreement that has been entered into by previous is, is as a result of personalization. When people come into public office, they think that is their personal, their personal office. But you are elected into public office. Your responsibility is to continue from where your uh, predecessor stopped mm. from, so that you continue from that. But in Nigeria, no, I want to start my own program, and that's why you see that they name every public project after themselves. And I'm looking forward to a situation where even Sarah will be addressing that. Stopping elected public officials from naming projects as if they use their own personal fund to fund that project. And they call it pet project. And that's one of the things that has led us to where we are. We are now because Amosu was not interested in going after the project of his, of, of his predecessor. 
So he has to start his own project. Every contract that was entered, allegedly, mm -hmm. was severed. And you put Ogun State into debt, you put Nigeria into, into disrepute. It's, it's and it's not, looking like, uh, it's not looking like some form of a personal war and a personal battle between these things. Personalities are being thrown mm -hmm. under the bus. You've said that you expected the EFCC will call all the involved uh, parties. Exactly. You had expected they would have done it. Do you still believe that any such thing will be done? That's why this program is existing. We are calling on them to do their due diligence. It's their responsibility. It's, it's an economic and financial crime. Yes or no? These are the things that yes, you should be doing. These are the things that you should be doing. It's an economic and financial crime. And so this particular issue should be investigated. I would have expected the EFCC chairman to have granted mm. a press conference just like he did for Yaya Belu. And um, he said that um, it's on him if Yaya Belu is not... Um, is not is not brought to book and so we are still we waiting still for that find him. Yeah, exactly i want to move on to one headline here inside of the daily times still and it touches everybody the return of fuel queues fuel queues resurface wow. in lagos and so stock uh, uh shortage i don't know if it's shortage i keep asking whether it's a shortage or whether they're just mm -hmm. hoarding now in march i remember um the managing director of financial derivatives company limited bismarck rwani telling that diesel prices are going to fall we're waiting for dangote as the savior uh, and that's also going to affect fuel prices, it's going to fall. However, since then, we've seen the back and forth between the Nigerian government and uh, the uh, Dangote refinery. Let's put that aside for the, for, uh, for the meantime. And let's look at the current situation now, where I bought fuel at 815 naira per liter uh, two days ago, and I hear people are buying at 900 naira now. It seems like it, it would seem that there's a frustration happening inside of the sector and people are beginning to ask questions or argue that there are certain bodies, a very small number of people who are trying to take advantage of what's happening right now or at least sabotage whatever uh, um, gains we might make with uh, the Dangote refinery. What is your take on the current situation regarding the few queues resurfacing? Is it being hoarded? <laughs> is it a shortage? What are we looking at here? Are you even sure of the quality of the fuel you are The buying? quality of the fuel. You are buying. And let me personalize this. As I was coming for this show this morning, my car got stuck on the road. There is fuel inside the car. And just got a new battery. And um, I'm sure it's, it's the quality of the fuel inside the car. So are we even sure of the quality of the fuel which, which, which you buy? And um, the issue of cabal. In, one of the things, personal opinion, that I thought that the president would have done was to have a complete overhaul of that sector by doing away with the past and starting afresh. Um, we had these challenges with the present. The present MD of, um, of GMD of um, NNPC, still the, the one that was there in Durari's administration, still the one that is there. Uh, now, we are paying more fuel subsidy that has been removed. Even when we are paying less than this, the fuel scarcity was not as, as recurrent as we have, it. we have it now. You bought it. 750, some bought it 850, some bought, some bought it 900, some bought it 900, 900 naira. I thought at the end of this year I'll go and look for fuel um, because um, I hope by that today we have that fuel. And nobody's explaining anything, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, I think that's they, 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 it's like, we are just left to our own as if things fall apart and descend. Nobody's explaining, not even the. The Ministry of Petroleum, which is headed by the president, supported by Minister of State for Petroleum, not even the NNPC. It's like, you know what, we are just left at the mercies of the operators in that particular sector, and we are left to be exploited by those that are operating within that, within that particular system, and which some might call it conspiracy theory. Until Dangote came out and spoke about that particular issue, um, a lot of people used to think that it's conspiracy theory. Now, it's, it's driving home the point that well there are there are some elements within that sector that don't want us to succeed in that particular sector they want us to continue with the present arrangement in which nigeria will be losing money we don't want to refine the product locally because if we refine the product locally the money they are repatriating through first subsidy will not be able to repatriate uh, that money you know it gives them an opportunity to repatriate fund mm. i mean it's really i mean i think the part that you've highlighted about how we've We've just accepted it as a normal part of life. That's what really breaks my heart. And I was saying this, that it feels like once we have one week of no trouble, I'm already expecting that in the next two weeks one. something is going to happen. Mm. There's going to be fuel scarcity. I, I don't know if we've had any year where we've had this much fuel scarcity as we've had in 2024. I don't recall. You know, I, I, don't, I can't say as a matter of fact, but it just feels like every week there's been fuel scarcity. Let's hear from uh, Elder David. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Now, David, please go ahead. 
Yeah, I think All right, we've seems lost that, him. Uh, we've lost him. Yeah. Um, so we're seeing here that on the front page of the Daily Times, and this is a story that we've seen in other ones, drought, Kogi government and farmers seek divine intervention. I'm going to read what it says. It said, Kogi state government and, all, and the All Farmers Association of Nigeria on Sunday called for prayers for rainfall following the devastating effect of drought. Um, this is very sad. I mean, I don't know how to feel about this because... They knew. I don't think that we're taken by surprise by the weather predictions. We have weather forecasts for a reason, but why aren't we pre-planning? Why aren't we getting to the point where we can figure out alternative measures? I mean, cloud, uh, uh, cloud seedling in, in the UAE. They, I don't know if, when, if we would ever get to that point where people can start to talk about generating artificial rainfall and we can start to look yeah, at alternative measures to, to boost our like agricultural sector. Fiction. I know that that sounds like a very far cry, but let's hear from our next call. That's we have a Fred. caller calling in and then we'll come back to talk about this. Hello, Fred. Good morning. Uh, good morning. All right, please go ahead. Yes, I want to thank the panelists um, for their input so far, and uh, especially the gentleman there is the analyst. Um, I think uh, you're doing a great job. And looking at the situation right now concerning this first case, the problem with NNPC, sincerely, I'm one of those that really don't trust what's going on with the government. And I don't think America is, is, is going to, whatever his name is, is going to be um, taken out of the picture. I think he's going to remain there for whatever reasons, just like Mahmoud is going to remain there, just like the DSS official too. Is going to, uh, the DSS uh, director too is going to remain there. Until the right thing is done going forward, we will still continue to suffer, and Nigerians will continue to suffer, and there will still be no trust in the government. That's just my take. Thank you. Oh, very interesting uh, standpoint there. But let's go back to the conversation earlier. I think that I'm asking for too much when I'm talking about us looking for alternative measures. Whilst Kogi State is seeking divine intervention, the Punch also reports that food crisis may worsen as flood hits 10 states. Farmers grown as floods ravage farmlands in Sokoto, Kano, KB, seven of us. Sema seeks government help as drought dries up crops in four states and 31 states risk flooding. We have weather prediction for a reason. I don't think that we're taken by surprise when a number of these things happen. We foresee them. But do we have adequate measures, or would you say that we put in adequate measures to ensure that we're adequately prepared for, let's say, the drought or the flood? This is the lack of capacity. You said it earlier on. I'm talking about United Arab Emirates. In, in the 60s, in the, in the 70s, we had food sufficiency in Nigeria. Agriculture was the mainstay of Nigerian economy. Um, um, God blessed us with arable land, blessed us with different types of weather. You had, let's take a cue from Kogi State. Kogi State is bounded by two rivers. Don't forget it's a confluence state, River Niger and River Benue. You will have thought that the state government will have invested in irrigation system to have cover up for um, the debt the, of, yeah. of, of, of rainfall. But you see the basic thing most government have done from 1999 to date is what I call the ABC of government. You know what is it? What Construction is it? of roads, yes. infrastructure. Any idiot can do that, quote unquote. All you just need is the design and the money and you pay the contractor to do the project. But the real nitty gritty, the X, Y, Z of public governance, we have not gotten it from those we have given responsibility to manage their affairs. How do we come about ensuring food security? How do we combat natural disaster in order for, for it not to affect our food supply? How do we grow our economy so through industrialization? How do we address the power sector? You know, oh. when we talk about all of this and then what they will come when they do their 100 days in the office, four years in the office, you have beat 100 roads, you have beat 300,000 projects. something, Mr. Johnson, it's funny that you ask these questions because, first of all, I majored in agriculture well, but as a botanist. And um, I, I, for a very long time, we've always noted that most of the product, produce that comes from the north, we actually have half of them actually go to waste because we cannot process them. The north is very sunny very arid. You can actually process tomatoes if you dry it up and then you can make puree from out of them. We don't do that. Our road systems are terrible. Well, you know what's going on, especially with the hike in fuel or diesel prices now. It uh, makes transportation very hard. However, there is one aspect that we don't look at as a government or as a people, and that is storage. You talk about the seven-year drought in the Bible. What saved them? Storage. So what about policies for storage or infrastructure for storage, rather, 
uh, when it comes to agriculture. Why don't we have that? In the past, we used to have the groundnut pyramids, and they would stay there for months. Um, I worked at a silo growing up uh, as a student, and I know how long you can actually store wheat for, for years. But we don't seem to be focusing on that at all. Because that will not give... I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer. Um, I think we have Kolade from Lagos joining us via phone call now. Kolade, please go ahead. Do remember the question, Johnson. Kolade, please, let's have you. Hello? Yes, Kolade, go ahead. What did you say? Kolade, there's a bit of a challenge with your yes, audio. Yes, exactly. You know, I, so, please call back and turn down the volume of your TV set when you do. Storage, why? It's, it's, it's very simple. The example I gave, it was about comprehensive storage system. How do you protect food for seven years? In that, in that case, in that particular case, it was for 14 years. said we'll build silos, we'll build carriageways. You remember in the 60s, in the 70s, in the, in the, in the 40s, in the 50s, we had a railway system. Mm -hmm. It was an integrated railway system that works very, very well, that we used to move food produce from the north, from the east to the south, even down to Apapa, and then for some of it to be shipped to be shipped abroad, which we hand foreign exchange and it. Don't forget the three, the three regions until the Midwest was created later were sustained by agriculture, mm. not only for local production, but the one for, for, the one for, the one for export. So what has, for example, what investment has states since 1999 made concerning agriculture? Let's talk about Lagos State. Let's talk about Ogun State. Let's talk about Ondo State. Let's talk about... Ikiti State. Let me talk about Southwest because I'm from the Southwest. What investment? I don't seem to see anyone. Okay, let's talk about one that was done previously. In, in the last administration, you have the Lagos Kirby Rice, which is called the Lake, Lake Rice. What has happened to that? It was a partnership between Lagos and Kirby, right. Kirby State, which gave back to a rice mill in Imota, mm. in Imota, which one of the best. What has happened? What has happened? What has happened to that? You see, one of it is we don't have continuity of Policies too, we have the, we lack the capacity. People that have the technical know. You see, when we talk about Ford, there was one that happened under Jonathan administration. When the present uh, African Development Bank was the minister of, there was an interview which he granted on how they were able to control the flood and release the flood back back to the to the to 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 to, to, to the farmland. We need the right people in the right place to get the right thing right. done. I mean, there, there's more to look at with regards to that conversation, but we have Lenny joining us from Abuja. Good morning, Lenny. Please go ahead. Uh, I want to talk about this security issue, like, like the one they just could now this 20 medical students. I believe that our security uh, this agency can do something about it, like they can do something about it. Now, ask me how. If I am in my village, and I make a video or I make a phone call and I insult a, a DSS direct, uh, this thing, is it direct or uh, whatever, ID of police, I will be picked up in 24 hours, in less than 24 hours. Now, these kidnappers make calls. They make calls to these people, um, to their loved ones, to their agency or this thing. These people will not be picked up. Remember during that, this last, um, this last, uh, uh, protest. A guy made a video, TikTok video in Kaduna. He was picked up less than 24 hours. So this, we know, they know what they are doing. Understand? They know very much what they are doing. Like I say again, if I am in my city village making a call now, I install any, um, even the, the uh, 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 army general, any of the army general, I'll be picked up in 24 hours. That is the truth. So a kidnap, these people have been kidnapped for days now. Nothing. They are making calls. We cannot be tracked. They can't be tracked. Who are we lying to? We know these things. Who are we lying to? So that's not just my contribution. Thank you. Plenty. What he said is not something that we've heard. There are people who would say that if you insult the government, if you insult the president now, mm -hmm. or you say something really damning, they will find you. So why is it that it's very complicated for them to find criminals? In this case, there was a student who tweeted from the location of his kidnap. Yet, this is day four and we've heard nothing. Uh, there's no accountability. That's just it. People are not held accountable. Like the foil issue, we don't have forest security, we don't have food security, we don't even have uh, personal safety and personal security. Because there's, look, for example, who is the commissioner of police for, has he granted a press conference? Well, I, I mean, I'm um, even wondering about uh, the... So, so, 
hour by hour updates. Because what we see in other countries, when something of this magnitude has happened, they are giving us updates. Updates not just to calm Nigerians, but also the family members of those who have been kidnapped. I shudder to think about their family members and what they're going through in this time. So, but we don't see anything like we have that. Been, we are, we, people have resorted to self-help. Because you have left on your own, you, you fend for yourself for your water, you fend for yourself for your fuel, you fend for yourself for your energy, you fend for yourself for your own personal, personal security because these are the things that you expect government to provide for you. And the bottom line is that we don't hold. Have you ever seen any security chief at any level, whether at local, state or federal, being fired as a result of security infraction? Still speaking about mm. security infraction, I had asked our guest this earlier, and I'm going to ask you about um, the Terrorism Prevention Act 2013 Amendment Bill, which was passed into uh, 2022, which was passed into the law on the 27th of April by the Senate. It says, and I quote, Section 14 reads, Anyone who transfers funds, makes payments, or colludes with an abductor, kidnapper, or terrorist to receive any ransom for the release of any person who has been wrongfully confined, imprisoned, or kidnapped, is guilty of a felony and is liable on conviction to a term of imprisonment of not less than 15 years. So we've criminalized paying terrorists. But in today's world, in Nigeria, people are still raising funds because, unfortunately, their loved ones are being kidnapped. And they would rightfully tell you that they cannot just sit back, fold their hands, and leave, you know, situation to the law enforcement. In fact, there have been people who have said that the law enforcement agencies would tell them to go and raise the money that the abductors are asking for. So how do we justify this? And, you know, how, how do we justify this vis-a-vis -vis our current reality? This is a section that is far away from reality. You are meant to make law for the good of society based on what is prevailing in the society. And because most of these laws are shrouded in secrecy, um, they pass this law without public scrutiny, without the involvement of the citizenry. And that's why you see that the letter of the law does not conform with the spirit of what is happening in the society. Because this, for example, you have your loved one being kidnapped and you are left on your own and you are required to pay ransom. You rather risk paying the ransom than waiting for, and than complying with yeah. these particular uh, provisions. And like people have pointed out, why is it that the, there are technology for you to track phone call? There are technology for you to track phones. Uh, there are no mark money again that once you, the, 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 the security agencies will work with the family and then you pay the ransom with marked money, and which will enable you to trace, to trace this particular fund to those that are, that, are involved, that are involved. There's a lot of conspiracy theories out there that sometimes, quote unquote, even some of the security agencies are probably culpable in some of these, in some of these challenges that we have in hand. Taking a cue from what one of the famous Nigerian leaders that is still paying us even after his death, you know, General Abacha said that if his insecurity lasts more than 24 hours, then, then there, is, there is culpability on the part of those that are in charge of managing the security. Mm -hmm. Security, you, you might tend to believe what he said because the reality on ground is that we keep hearing stories of kidnapping day right. in, day out. Have you ever seen a successful prosecution? None. Of one. Well, in some cases, some of them will come back. Some of them will have even functioned as terrorists to come and repent, and then the government will forgive them and integrate them back into society. <laughs> Today, Johnson, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure us. to be here on this Monday morning. Thank you for having me. All right.